a game of badminton, two plastic shopping bags, a Mars bar, and a dirty diaper. These seemingly arbitrary things are sometimes overlooked in what is regarded by many as the most intriguing tale of espionage and escape ever to emerge from the Cold War period. Oleg Gordievsky was the highest ranking KGB officer to ever become a British spy. He almost single-handedly shaped world events at one of the most dangerous times in global history when humanity peered over the precipice of nuclear holocaust. The plan to rescue him from deep behind the Iron Curtain after he was compromised was thought to be virtually impossible. While to his motherland he remains a traitor, to the western world he is a hero that risked it all for the sake of the democratic freedoms most of us take for granted. This is the true life tale of Britain's greatest spy. Oleg's father was Anton Gordievsky. During the 1917 Russian Revolution, he became a fervent, committed communist and remained so until the end of his life. In 1920, Anton Gordievsky was deployed to Kazakhstan, where he participated in the forced seizure of grain by the Bolshevik government from farmers. The policy, known as collectivization, caused severe famine in Russia and ultimately the deaths of between 4 to 7 million people. In the early 1930s, Anton Gordievsky joined the OGPU, which was the forerunner of the NKVD, itself the predecessor of the KGB. Olga, Oleg's mother, while secretly disdainful of the communist system, played the role of ideal KGB wife. Her contempt likely stemmed from her family's experiences of the system, her father losing his watermill to the communists and her brother being sent to the Gulag for 10 years for criticizing agricultural collectivization. She did not, like her husband, believe that the Communist Party was infallible, recognizing the great purge by Stalin of millions of so-called enemies of the people for what it was. Oleg was the younger brother of two siblings, a sister, Marina, and an older brother, Vasily, who was also a member of the KGB and an illegal spy. Illegal spies were so-called because they operated without formal cover and thus under a heightened level of danger. Many spies during the Cold War posed as foreign diplomats stationed in embassies or as journalists and were somewhat protected by the rules of international law. Oleg himself was born on 10 October 1938, at the very tail end of the Great Purge. His early childhood was as to be expected in Russia during World War II. Food was rationed and poverty was a way of life. Oleg and his family lived in relative comfort in Moscow from 1943 after the fighting died down due to the privileges his father enjoyed as a member of the NKVD. By age 6, Oleg had learned to read and showed aptitude particularly for history and languages when he attended School 130. Perhaps his earliest exposure to reading material outside of communist propaganda was reading British Ally, a sheet produced in Russian by the British Embassy intended to improve British-Russian relations. At age 14, like all Russian boys, he joined the Komsomol, or Young Communist League. It was here that Oleg was first exposed to the workings and methodologies of the Communist Party. Oleg became the head of his Komsomol organization at his school at age 17. Joseph Stalin died on 5 March 1953, and in 1956 was denounced by Nikita Khrushchev, the succeeding Premier of the Soviet Union. This was the year that Oleg entered university at the prestigious Institutes of International Relations, where he studied German and other subjects such as law, military affairs, and history. Oleg recalls the death of Stalin and his later denunciation by the Communist Party as key events in the start of the unravelling of his Soviet Marxist ideology. While at that stage Oleg remained committed to communism, believing that a communist utopia was achievable, he became a conscious anti-Stalinist. For a brief time following Stalin's death, the new leader of the Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev, allowed a number of liberal reforms, including unprecedented levels of freedom of expression, this time was, however, short-lived, owing in part to the Hungarian Revolution of October 1956. The Communist Party invaded Hungary, brutally quashed the rebellion, and along with it ended Khrushchev's reforms. The Soviet Union returned to its former, frozen self. Learning of these events and realizing that people in other countries wanted to live a different way piqued Gordievsky's interest in overseas travel. Oleg wanted to see the world outside of the Soviet Union, and to this end enrolled in English classes which bettered his chances of an international posting after university. The English course was over-enrolled, and so he did not get in. But at his brother's recommendation, Oleg enrolled in the Swedish class, which he told was the doorway to the rest of Scandinavia. 
Gordievsky also took up cross-country running where he met classmate Stanislaw Stander Kaplan, a Czechoslovakian national who later defected from the Soviet Union to the West. The KGB operated an office within the university from which they sought to identify new recruits. Vasily facilitated Oleg's first formal introduction to the KGB. Oleg's interview took place in 1961 near KGB headquarters. He was given his first assignment while in his final year of his studies, and which was a six-month posting to East Berlin as a German translator in the Russian embassy. Here Oleg witnessed the almost overnight construction of the Berlin Wall, erected by the East German government in haste to prevent the flow of people fleeing to the democratic West. The time Oleg spent in East Germany was significant in that it was his first foray into espionage, and it gave him a tangible view of the polar opposite outworkings of communist versus capitalist ideologies. After completing his studies, Oleg officially joined the KGB on 31 July 1962, swearing to commit himself to defend his country to the last drop of blood and to keep state secrets. Oleg wanted to follow in his brother's footsteps as an illegal spy, but to his disappointment was deployed to Directorate S in Moscow. There he was tasked with preparing documentation for other illegal spies. While in this position, Oleg married Yelena Akopian, who was a German language teacher. He hoped that his marriage, in particular to a foreign language speaker, would bolster his chances of receiving a post overseas in the future. The lucky break Gordievsky was waiting for came in 1965, when he was offered a consular official's position dealing with visas and inheritances in the Russian embassy in Copenhagen, Denmark. But Oleg's true assignment was to manage a network of undercover KGB spies. In January 1966, Oleg and Yelena moved to Copenhagen, and Oleg began his work gathering information and searching for Scandinavian identities that could be adopted and used by the KGB spies in the country. The contrast between Soviet Moscow and vibrant Copenhagen could not have been more stark. Oleg delighted in tasting the fruits of Western democracy for the first time. In particular, the abundance of literature banned or simply unavailable in the Soviet Union. Of the 20 officials posted at the Russian Embassy in Copenhagen, 14 were KGB or GRU operatives. Oleg found his colleagues in general to be lazy and disinterested in doing any actual spy work. Oleg was determined to distinguish himself from his peers, and after performing his official duties in the morning, he set to work learning Danish and developing a local network of undercover spies and contacts in Copenhagen. While Oleg's career flourished, his marriage to Yelena did not. The marriage was poisoned in part by Yelena's anti-domestic tendencies and feminist views, but what stung Gordievsky more than this, however, was the revelation that Yelena had been pregnant but aborted the baby without first speaking to him. Another event that played a dramatic role in Gordievsky's shifting Soviet sentiments were the events in 1968 in Czechoslovakia, which was itself a socialist republic. During what was called the Prague Spring, mass political liberalization and administrative decentralization took place. This ideological rebellion was not well received by the Soviet Union, which promptly invaded to crush the movement. Czechoslovakia remained under direct Soviet control until its collapse in 1989. Oleg watched on with dismay and disgust, the events in Czechoslovakia all too similar to what happened in Hungary some years before. He knew that, as with all Russian diplomatic officials in Denmark, his home and telephone had been bugged by the PET, which was the Danish intelligence service. He called Yelena to express his consternation, cursing the Soviet Union for its actions. He hoped that his message would be overheard and taken as a signal of intent to his Danish counterparts. Oleg returned to Russia with Yelena in 1970. There, Gordievsky suffered from acute cultural withdrawals, resenting the repressive, stifled and generally unhappy atmosphere in Moscow that he had returned to. For the next three years, Gordievsky effectively trod water, both professionally and personally. Two events prompted his return to Denmark, the first of which was the expulsion of 105 Soviet spies from Great Britain and other countries including Denmark, which resulted in a need to rebuild the KGB presence in the various embassies. The second was the untimely death of Oleg's brother, Vasily, at age 39 due to chronic alcoholism. Gordievsky returned to Copenhagen in October 1972, this time as a political intelligence officer of the KGB's first chief directorate. 
His primary unofficial responsibilities were to identify, recruit, and manage Danes prepared to sell or trade information and secrets to the Soviet Union. PET and MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service, had already taken a keen interest in Oleg by the time he returned to Copenhagen. Stander Kaplan, Gordievsky's friend from the university cross-country running team, named Oleg among many others who may be susceptible to an approach by Western spies due to his expressed disillusionment with the Soviet system. One night, Stander arrived unannounced on Oleg's doorstep, on the pretext that he was in town for business. After sharing a cautious, uncomfortable drink, Stander invited Oleg to lunch. This was of course a setup by MI6 and PET. While nothing concrete or obvious was discussed, Stander reported back to his superiors that Oleg remained a promising prospect. The next step in the drawn-out courtship between Gordievsky and Western intelligence was made possible by a game of badminton. Gordievsky had taken up playing the sport each morning with a friend, and this became known to Richard Bromhead, who was the head of MI6 in Copenhagen. Bromhead and Gordievsky knew each other vaguely from within the diplomatic circles they both operated, but his arbitrary arrival at the court so early in the morning, dressed in a tweed suit, could only mean one thing. MI6 was trying to recruit Gordievsky. The two agreed to meet for lunch to have an honest conversation at the Osterport Hotel. This was not made easy by the fact that neither spoke the other's first language fluently. Both men knew that they were playing an extremely dangerous game. Bromhead was concerned that perhaps Gordievsky was trying to recruit him into the KGB, whereas Gordievsky was not certain that he was not being set up by his own organization. The lunch went ahead. Gordievsky and Bromhead sized each other up by discussing religion, philosophy, and music for the most part. As a way to protect himself, Gordievsky reported to the KGB that he intended to meet Bromhead, which is something that would not be considered untoward given Gordievsky's recruitment mandate. Bromhead is said to have left the meeting slightly more convinced that Gordievsky was aiming to recruit him. Then, for eight months, nothing happened. There appears to be no real explanation for this, save that MI6 was following other leads at the time. While Gordievsky did not enjoy the wait, it gave him pause to think and conclude that if the lunch had been a stitch-up, the KGB would not have waited so long to re-establish contacts to complete the job. Bromhead then reappeared at the badminton court and a second lunch was arranged. At this meeting, Bromhead chose to reveal his hand, asking Gordievsky directly whether he would be prepared to share information with British intelligence, and if he would agree to meet again, in private, somewhere secure. Oleg agreed on both counts, and this time he filed no report on what was an unsanctioned meeting with Bromhead. It was from this moment, in 1974, that Oleg Gordievsky became a double agent for the MR6, codenamed Sunbeam. Gordievsky and Bromhead met again three weeks later, this time at a safe house, or OCP, Operational Clandestine Premises, which was a flat within a residential suburb of Copenhagen. Bromhead indicated that he would be handing over the running of Gordievsky's case to Philip Hawkins, who spoke German and thus would be able to communicate with Gordievsky more effectively. The initial meeting between Gordievsky and his new handler did not go quite as Oleg expected. He was interrogated at length about his position, the people and operations of those Russians stationed in Copenhagen, and the workings of the KGB generally. During this first meeting, Gordievsky took the opportunity to set out the conditions under which he would agree to spy for the British. Number one, his KGB colleagues at his station should be protected. Number two, he was not to be secretly recorded or photographed. And number three, no money was to change hands. Gordievsky was operating from a sense of ideological conviction, not greed. These conditions were reluctantly accepted, however the second condition of no secret photographs or recording was not adhered to. All meetings were tape recorded. Hawkins and Gordievsky continued to meet at the safe house, twice every two months, where Gordievsky systematically broke down and revealed the intricate inner workings of the KGB and his role in it over the prior ten years. In 1977, Hawkins handed over the running of Sunbeam to Jeffrey Guskett, another MI6 handler with whom Gordievsky immediately struck up a rapport. MI6 had to be careful with what they did with the information disclosed by Gordievsky. Acting too quickly or expelling KGB agents en masse would certainly reveal to the KGB that they had a mole. MI6 could not afford to compromise the source of information, Gordievsky being the highest ranking KGB officer ever to spy for the British. Only a select number of MI6 and PET agents were indoctrinated into the Gordievsky case, 
and the information he provided was highly sanitized before being shared with anybody outside those in the know or within other intelligence agencies. Gordievsky routinely smuggled microfilm strips containing memos, instructions, letters and other secret Soviet documents out of the Russian embassy. He delivered these to Guskets via a brush contact. Guskett had commissioned the invention of a small device from the MI6 technical department which was capable of copying microfilm in a time short enough to allow Gordievsky to return to the embassy along with the original microfilm without sounding any alarms. As time wore on and the floodgates of secret information flowing out of the Russian embassy in Copenhagen opened, Gordievsky relaxed his conditions. He knew his meetings with his handler were being taped, and he revealed the names of his KGB colleagues and the illegal spies which he ran. He also had money deposited into a London bank account to serve as a contingency if things went pear-shaped for him. It was during this time that Gordievsky met a young woman named Leila Alieva, who was 11 years his junior and a typist for the World Health Organization. The two fell in love and so began Gordievsky's extramarital affair with who would later become his second wife. Three years passed with Gordievsky living his double life, both professionally and personally, with his posting in Denmark coming to an end in 1978. Returning to the Soviet Union represented a huge risk for Gordievsky. While he did not believe he had been compromised or his secret identity as a British spy revealed, if his actions ever did come to light, it would certainly be the end of his life and he would have little chance of escape from the Soviet Union. Despite being offered the opportunity of defecting there and then, Gordievsky declined, knowing that he still had more to offer the West. Gordievsky therefore decided to return to Russia. The time had come to devise a plan to rescue and exfiltrate Sunbeam from Russia should the need arise. And so was born Operation Pimlico. The plan to rescue Gordievsky from behind the Iron Curtain was devised by Veronica Price one of the first women officers in the British intelligence service. Her plan was as intricate as it was dangerous. Never before had a KGB double agent been exfiltrated from within Russia, let alone its heart, Moscow. Every single detail of the plan had to run like clockwork. A break in any link of the chain would likely spell disaster, and the death or imprisonment not only of Gordievsky, but potentially those assisting him too. The plan went as follows. Stage one, the signal. If Gordievsky believed he was at risk and wanted to activate the escape plan, he would stand outside a designated bread shop in Moscow at 7.30pm on a Tuesday evening while holding a Safeway plastic bag and wearing a grey leather cap and a pair of grey trousers. A member of MI6 would be on the lookout every Tuesday at that specific time. To indicate that the signal had been received, the agent on duty would walk past Gordievsky while holding a green Harrods shopping bag, eating either a Kit Kat or a Mars bar, and also wearing an item of grey clothing. Brief eye contact would be made, but the agent would not stop and would continue walking. Stage 2. The Execution Three days after flying the signal, Gordievsky would catch an overnight train from Moscow to Leningrad. From there, he would catch a taxi to the Finland train station and catch another train to Zelenogorsk, a town along the coast of the Baltic Sea. From there, Gordievsky was to catch a bus heading towards the Finnish border getting off at a specific turnout spot 16 miles south of a town called Varborg. While Gordievsky made his way to this rendezvous point, two MI6 officers would leave Moscow in a vehicle with diplomatic license plates, the reason being that diplomatic cars were not customarily searched at the border by the Russian authorities. Assuming the MI6 officers were able to leave Leningrad on the Friday afternoon, they would be able to reach the rendezvous point at exactly 2.30pm on Saturday to meet Gordievsky. The officers were to pack picnic items as cover for turning off the road in a seemingly arbitrary place. One of the officers opening the boot of the car would signal to Gordievsky to emerge from hiding and enter the boot. Gordievsky would be given a space blanket, which was a precaution to avoid detection by infrared cameras and heat detectors, and tranquilizer pills. The MI6 officers would continue towards the Finnish border, crossing multiple security checkpoints along the way and all the while hoping that the vehicle would not be searched. Once the Finnish border was crossed, Gordievsky would be free and Operation Pimlico would have been successfully executed. Simple, really. A second plan was put in place, should Gordievsky have wanted to send a message to MI6 from Moscow. The plan was again two-staged. 
Stage one was that an undercover MR6 officer would stand under the clock in Moscow Central Market on the third Saturday of every month at 11 a.m. The agent would be wearing an item of grey clothing and would carry the Harrods bag. If Oleg wished to send a message, he would make his presence known to the agent and would again be wearing his grey cap and trousers carrying the Safeway plastic bag. Stage two was that three Sundays after the signal was given, Gordievsky would go to St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square and climb a spiral staircase at the rear of the building at 3 p.m. At precisely this time, an MI6 agent wearing grey clothing and carrying a grey item would descend the stairs. As the two crossed paths on the narrow staircase, Gordievsky would pass a written message. As it turned out, the second plan proved too elaborate, as we'll hear later on. Gordievsky and MI6 agreed that he would not continue his spying operations while in Moscow. It was simply too risky, and the prospects of maintaining the stream of information that was possible in Denmark simply would not happen. Upon returning to Russia, Gordievsky announced that he would be divorcing Yelena and intended to marry Leila. This decision struck a significant but inevitable blow to his career prospects. The KGB were puritanical when it came to marriage and did not condone divorce. Making things worse was that Oleg engaging in an adulterous affair while overseas and on assignment was considered unprofessional in the extreme. Personal dramas were also often taken advantage of within the KGB's competitive arena by ambitious officers wanting to eliminate candidates competing for promotion. Gordievsky and Yelena nevertheless followed through with their divorce and Oleg promptly married Leila in a small simple ceremony. Despite being a senior KGB officer, Gordievsky really had no specific role at this point in his career. The divorce meant that his promotion to deputy head of the third department of the first chief directorate did not happen. He still however maintained designs on a second western posting, perhaps this time in England itself. To this end, he set his sights on a transfer to the KGB's British department and enrolled in an English course. This he completed within two years. Oleg's personal life became a lot more settled during this time, with he and Leila growing their family, having two daughters named Maria and Anna. While Gordievsky was no longer providing information to the West, MR6 continued to act on the secrets and information he provided while stationed in Denmark. Soviet spies identified by Gordievsky were systematically rooted out from their positions in various Western intelligence services and were either expelled or tried and imprisoned. The Western intelligence agencies did their best to obfuscate their source, but this could not prevent the KGB from becoming suspicious. Rumours swirled around the KGB about the presence of a mole, and Gordievsky lived under a constant sense of foreboding, not knowing whether some tip-off or act of carelessness would lead the KGB directly to him. Gordievsky managed however to survive this period unscathed, and in 1981, the lucky break he was waiting for happened. A position opened up in the Russian embassy in London. With sufficient time having passed since his divorce, Gordievsky was the right man at the right time and was given the job. While Gordievsky's British visa was granted in record time, there were a few months delay internally within the KGB while various departments did checks on Oleg's financial, medical and job history. Gordievsky used the time to study British political affairs and the files that he had access to in the British section of the KGB. Eventually, towards the end of June 1982, the Gordievsky family left for London. Oleg's official position in the London Embassy was that of councillor. Three things did not impress him in Britain. The grubby streets of London as compared to pristine Copenhagen, his family's allocated Kensington High Street flat, and his bosses at the Russian Embassy. Gordievsky had to deal with much animosity from his superiors, who were considered to be ill-tempered and generally foul. During his second evening in London, Gordievsky called a secret telephone number given to him by MR6 years prior. He then clandestinely met with MR6 and was introduced to his new handler, whom he knew as Jack. Jack was to be assisted by Joan, whose real name was Veronica Price, the mastermind of Operation Pimlico. Soon thereafter, the spying operations resumed as before, except on a much larger scale with the abundance of intelligence that Gordievsky had access to in his more senior position at the Russian embassy. Microfilm was no longer in use, so documents had to be smuggled out of the embassy to meetings in the MR6 safe house. Oleg had to ensure he returned quickly so that no documents would be missed or suspicions aroused. As to his duties as a KGB spy, 
Gordievsky was fed a near unlimited supply of true, but mostly harmless, secret information with which he filled his reports. This impressed Oleg's bosses and he continued as a rising star within the ranks of the KGB. Gordievsky's arrival in London just about coincided with the start of Soviet Operation Ryan during the Cold War. This was the brainchild of hyper-paranoid then chief of the KGB and later head of the Soviet Union, Yuri Andropov. Permanent operational assignment to uncover NATO preparations for a nuclear missile attack on the USSR, as it was known by its full name, had the goal of uncovering plans by the US and NATO countries to launch a preemptive nuclear missile strike against the USSR. In reality, no such plans existed. The KGB center was searching for evidence of an attack it was already convinced was going to happen, and the result was the wasting of thousands of KGB man hours and the ratcheting up of east-west tensions to levels not seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was particularly so during the NATO military exercise in 1983 called Able Archer. While all this was going on, Gordievsky had a scare when a British intelligence officer stationed in the counter-espionage section of MR5 attempted to become a paid spy for the Russians. Michael Bettany slipped two letters through the KGB residence post slot late at night. On the first occasion, he included British intelligence in which all known or suspected KGB agents in London were identified. Gordievsky was identified in the leaked report as Grade 2, or more or less identified as a KGB agent. For various reasons, the KGB resident Gook chose not to act on or to respond to the letters. This debacle ended favourably for Gordievsky, as KGB resident Gook was declared persona non grata by the British and sent packing back to Moscow. This opened the door for Gordievsky to be considered as his replacement. Gordievsky travelled back to Moscow in August 1983 for a holiday with his family and to discuss his future career prospects. Nikolaus Gribben was Oleg's superior at the time and told Gordievsky that he had designs for him to become the head of the KGB station in London. This was to be a monumental appointment, not only for Gordievsky's professional career, but for British intelligence who would for the first time have access to the highest level of secret information within the KGB. These discussions coincided with the rise to power of Mikhail Gorbachev as the new USSR president. Before his appointment as General Secretary of the Communist Party, Gorbachev conducted a tour of the United Kingdom, including meeting at various times with British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. By that stage, the Soviet Union was clearly losing the Cold War. The divide between East and West from an economic, technological and military point of view was ever widening, and Gorbachev's tour was seen as instrumental in rebuilding political relations between Britain and Russia. Gordievsky's role in the meetings that took place between the world leaders was pivotal. The information he received from British intelligence he fed back to the KGB, thus managing to shape the narrative of the discussions. It is widely recognized that the success of Gorbachev's tour was in large part due to Gordievsky's pulling of the political strings and behind-the-scenes involvement. Things could not have been going better for Gordievsky at that time. He was acting KGB resident in London, and was each day picking away at the rapidly diminishing vestiges of communist Russia. Then, like a bolt out of the blue, on 16 May 1985, he received a telegram. He had been summoned back to Moscow. What was the reason for Gordievsky's sudden recall to Moscow? He was told that his return was to officially confirm his appointment as resident, but that was both unnecessary and not customary. Everything related to his appointment had already been discussed and agreed. Oleg knew that this was no ordinary instruction. He feared immediately that he had been found out and that his trip back to Russia would be his last. But who had betrayed him? There were only a select few British, Scandinavian and North American intelligence agencies that were aware of his existence and activities, and even fewer that knew his real name. Enter Aldrich Ames, a CIA counter-espionage agent with a penchant for drinking and an inability to maintain the extravagant spending habits of his second wife. He became a spy for the Soviet Union in the early 1980s, for reasons which he admitted were personal gain. Despite the CIA not having been told Gordievsky's name by MI6, through a process of elimination, triangulation and a thorough review of tip-offs that led to Soviet spy arrests and expulsions, Gordievsky was identified as the likely candidate. 
This information came into the possession of Ames, who on 13 June 1985 disclosed Gordievsky among 24 other Western intelligence spies to the Soviet Union. Defecting at this point would have been the easiest option for Oleg. He had served the West with valour, and choosing then for he and his family to assume new identities under the protection of the British government would have been no slight on his honour. He had already done more for British intelligence during the Cold War than any spy before him. However, he knew that he still had more to offer. He was on the cusp of an official appointment as KGB resident in the Russian embassy in London. This was the most senior position he could have hoped to hold in the KGB and would certainly unlock access to an unprecedented level of top secret intelligence. While Gordievsky had his fears about his bosses having been tipped off about his MI6 involvement, it could have gone either way. Perhaps the recall was genuinely to discuss important matters in person with his superiors. Perhaps he would, in no time at all, return to London and have the opportunity to continue the work that he had committed his life to. Gordievsky chose to obey instructions. He did not defect, and after a brief goodbye to his family, boarded a flight to Moscow. Upon his return, Oleg immediately detected that his home had been broken into by the KGB. A deadbolt that he never used had been locked. He knew there and then that the jig was up. But exactly how much the KGB knew he could not tell. Gordievsky was then a colonel in the KGB and he would only be arrested once clear evidence of his espionage had been established. That he was not yet sitting in a prison cell to Oleg meant that the KGB was not aware of the full details of his treachery against the Soviet Union. Gordievsky reported for duty at KGB headquarters with great trepidation. After a relatively innocuous meeting with his boss, Gribbon, a few uneventful days passed. Gordievsky was then invited to spend the weekend at his boss's dacha, which he declined. He was then directed to attend a meeting outside of the KGB centre, which was highly irregular, to discuss high-level agent penetration in Britain. This was all a ruse, of course and while attending the meeting, two men unknown to Oleg joined the party. Gordievsky was given a spark drink of brandy containing some form of truth serum and so began a five-hour interrogation. He did not recall exactly what was asked or what was said, but he believed that despite a confession of being a British spy being demanded of him, he made no such guilty admissions. The interrogation ended when Gordievsky passed out. Gordievsky awoke in the bungalow, alive but with a raging headache. He was transported back to his home and reported to work the following day, as if nothing had happened. He was summoned to Gribbon's office, where other senior KGB members were present, and he was read the riot act. His position in London had been terminated, and, bizarrely, he was permitted to remain in the KGB, but working in a non-operational department. Gordievsky continued to protest his innocence, but he knew that he was living on borrowed time. Oleg's wife and children were soon thereafter transferred back to Moscow, Leila knew something was amiss, but Gordievsky tried to allay her fears, all the while continuing to conceal his second, secret life from his wife. His career in tatters and his very life on the line, Oleg decided that he had no option but to initiate Operation Pimlico. The prospects of a successful escape were minute as it was, and he knew that including his wife and two young daughters was impossible. Leila and his daughters left for their planned summer holidays, with Gordievsky only able to say the briefest goodbye to his wife as she entered a supermarket to do some pre-holiday shopping. Gordievsky returned to his flat and retrieved a set of cryptic escape plan instructions hidden in one of his books. His intention was to pass a written message to the MI6 agent that would brush past him at St. Basil's Cathedral. Paranoid and obsessed with the need for secrecy, he made his way towards the signal site near Kievsky station, all the while following a meticulous process of dry cleaning, which is the process of doubling back and taking a circuitous route to shake off any would-be followers. He walked to Moscow's central market at the designated time and took up his position on the pavement. All the while KGB limousines cruised past, transporting various officials to and from the Kremlin. He could only hope that an MI6 agent had noticed him standing there in his grey clothing and carrying the Safeway plastic bag. He had to wait until three Sundays later for the agreed time at which an MI6 agent would perform the brush contact, during which he would pass on his message. Gordievsky again followed a careful process of dry cleaning as he made his way to the Lenin Museum where he intended to write the message. He entered a cubicle on the toilet and penned a short note. 
Am under strong suspicion and in bad trouble. Need exfiltration soonest. Beware of radioactive dust and car accidents. From there he proceeded to St. Basil's Cathedral, but disaster struck. The spiral staircase on which the brush contact was to be made was blocked off, with a sign that read upper floor closed for redecoration. There was nothing Gordievsky could do except curse himself for agreeing to select St. Basil's Cathedral as the brush contact location. Oleg's remaining option was to formally signal for his escape plan to be initiated. On the evening of Tuesday, 16th of July 1985, he made his way to the signal site outside the bakery, donning his grey clothes and carrying the Safeway bag. Oleg's father-in-law had invited him to dinner that night, which served as a fortunate pretext to him leaving his home in the evening. Gordievsky arrived early at the signal spot, and to kill time, went to a nearby shop and bought a packet of cigarettes. This nearly proved a fatal decision because he did not smoke. The MI6 agent who was on duty to observe for Oleg's presence that evening, Arthur G, knew this fact. The minutes crawled past, when eventually, Oleg saw a man he thought gave off a rather British look, carrying a dark green Harrods shopping bag and eating a Mars bar. The two men made brief eye contact. Oleg later said that he felt like he was trying to shout through his eyes to the agent that he needed urgent help. And that was it. The signal had been given. Now Oleg had limited time to make his preparations, which included purchasing a railway ticket to Leningrad, an ordinarily straightforward task made extremely difficult by his need to shake off the KGB agents that followed his every move. He nevertheless managed to purchase his ticket after again following a stringent dry cleaning process, and so followed an agonizing few days until that Friday afternoon which was when he was to begin his journey. He packed light, taking with him only essential items that he could fit into a small carrier bag, he closed the door to his apartment, and to his life as he knew it, and made his way to the Moscow train station. His fourth class train ticket meant that Oleg shared a compartment with up to six others. He took some sedatives and went to sleep around 9pm that evening, waking up at 4am on Saturday morning on the floor of the compartment. In his sedative induced sleep he had fallen out of his bunk, cutting his head on the way down. He looked dishevelled and had blood on his face and shirt. He didn't exactly cut an inconspicuous figure. Upon arriving in Leningrad, Oleg caught a taxi which took him to the Finland station. Instead of taking a train to Varborg and then doubling back to the rendezvous point with MR6, he decided strangely to catch two buses, the first to Teriyaki and then another to Varborg. He eventually made it to the collection point at 11am on Saturday morning, but made another decision that in hindsight was extremely dangerous. Wanting to avoid lying in a ditch in the heat of the Russian summer while being bombarded by mosquitoes for hours, he started walking towards a nearby town and then hitchhiked a ride for the rest of the way. He bought himself lunch and two beers at a local cafeteria. While there, Gordievsky was spooked by two men that entered the cafe who he suspected to be KGB agents patrolling the frontier towns for runaways. Oleg left the cafeteria immediately without a backwards look. He was now 20 kilometers away from the rendezvous site and he again hitched a ride back to within walking distance of the turnout. He then lay in wait for his rescuers, who did not arrive until approximately 3pm due to their need to shake off their KGB tail and to avoid being detected when pulling off the highway at the rendezvous point. The rescue party consisted of MI6 officer Arthur G and his wife Rachel G in one vehicle, with husband and wife Roy and Caroline Ascot in the other. Two cars were needed since Western intelligence assumed that Gordievsky would try and smuggle his family out of Russia as well. The rescuers, knowing their diplomatic vehicles were bugged, were unable to communicate openly, and the trip to the Finnish border was done on the pretext of seeking medical treatment for Rachel G, who had a few days prior feigned having a severe back injury. The plan was for Rachel to see a doctor about her back, and then for the party to make a weekend of it in Finland, doing some shopping in the capital Helsinki. Roy and Caroline brought their 15-month-old baby along for the trip, which they considered good cover for their daring plan. When Gordievsky recognized G as the man from the signal site, he emerged from his hiding place and with little interaction with his rescuers, entered the boot of the second car. The rescue party then re-entered their vehicles and joined the highway, fortunately again not being spotted by their KGB tail. Within a period of half an hour, the two-car convoy passed through five separate frontier barriers. At the second to last check, disaster nearly struck. The Russian officials had brought out the sniffer dogs. If they detected the smell of Gordievsky in the boot, who was no doubt reeking pretty strongly at that point, it was game over. Caroline Ascot, recognizing the immediate danger, took out a packet of imported cheese and onion flavored crisps, a scent that no doubt Russian sniffer dogs had never been exposed to. 
she offered one of the dogs a crisp, who gobbled it down before being yanked back by its handler. Not out of the woods yet, and the dog continuing to circle the vehicle, by a stroke of sheer genius, she took her young daughter out of the vehicle to change a soiled nappy. She quickly dropped the dirty diaper on the floor near to where the dog was. The smelly nappy had the desired effect, with the sniffer dog promptly slinking off once confronted with the offensive odour. The party were shortly thereafter cleared to proceed, and were also passed through the final passport control checkpoint. They had done it. They had pulled off the most daring rescue attempt in Cold War history, exfiltrating a KGB colonel spy from the very heart of the Soviet Union. Once safely across the Finnish border, the cars stopped, the boot was opened, and a very sweaty, claustrophobic and petrified Oleg Gordievsky emerged into the bright sun and clear skies. Gordievsky's elation at having successfully escaped the KGB and the Soviet Union was tempered by the fact that he had to leave his family behind. It took six years and the collapse of the Soviet Union to eventually reunite him with his wife and children. Unfortunately, his marriage did not survive much time after that. The strain of the prevailing circumstances and the passage of time with virtually zero communication taking an obvious toll on the relationship. Gordievsky continued to serve the West, meeting with and consulting to world leaders on matters of the KGB, military intelligence and espionage. In 2007, he was appointed Companion of the Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George for services to the security of the United Kingdom. The same award bestowed upon Ian Fleming's most famous fictional spy, James Bond. For many years after his escape, Gordievsky lived in a London safe house under strict security measures implemented by the UK government. In the mid-2000s, however, he moved to an undisclosed location in Surrey. His life remains under threat. The Salisbury poisonings of other former KGB double agents are a reminder to Gordievsky that he will never taste the true freedom offered to ordinary citizens of the Western world. In the 2018 foreword to Gordievsky's autobiography, first published in 1995, Oleg laments the current state of Russian government, stating how despite no longer being communist, it is still controlled by the old KGB and continues its authoritarian quest for power by the ruling elite. Gordievsky cites Russian aggressions in eastern Ukraine, the Crimea and Syria as examples. No doubt, Gordievsky must today be mortified by Russia's despicable ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Now aged 83, Gordievsky continues to live in hope that more of the world will come to experience and enjoy the democratic freedoms espoused by most of the Western world. His contribution towards the Western Cold War effort cannot be understated, and all of us living in democratic societies today owe a debt of gratitude to the man who sacrificed everything for his ideological convictions. Much of the information contained in this video has been taken from two books. The first, Gordievsky's autobiography, Next Stop Execution, published in 1995, and the second, Ben McIntyre's bestseller, The Spy and the Traitor, published in 2018. I could not hope to do the story justice in a single YouTube video, so I highly recommend these books for thrilling reading and further insight into the intriguing life of Oleg Gordievsky.